Hello again. For those of you in my fourth period class, I forgot to show you this last slide on the previous lecture you listened to on Christoller's central place theory. So you first period people can just ignore this for a second. Uh, those of you fourth period people, remember I told you that this is a idea, Christoller's idea was created by a German guy for the Nazis. So this is a map, primary source for you that uh, shows you how he'd sort of mapped out German cities how we notice this pattern that uh, cities seem to be spread farther apart if they're larger. So here's your huge cities. You've got medium-sized cities sort of interspersed across the country, smaller cities and even smaller cities. So here's his real life portrayal of Germany and how it followed his theory of big and little cities, medium-sized cities all being evenly dispersed, relatively. All right, let's move on with the things that you just read about. Ah, this exciting topic of types of urban areas. So there's a few things we'll cover today. A uh, couple types of cities and then mostly these urban models which we'll have a bit of practice with. So uh, there's a bunch of types of cities in the world but uh, the main one we'll talk about for now is a megacity. We've already heard this term before, uh, at least I think some of us have heard it. Megacity is just a city with 10 million or more people. So we'll look at some lists of megacities here. You can see we've got three charts, 1950, 2000, 2015, and these are the top 10 largest cities in those three time periods. Do you notice a change? So let's check out the 1950 list. We've got New York, London, Tokyo, Paris, Moscow, Shanghai, city in Germany, Buenos Aires, hey, Chicago, and Calcutta, India. So uh, notice the numbers as well, 12 million, 8 million, 7 million, all the way down to 4 million. Okay, so let's check out the next list. We'll compare it. So we got Tokyo, Mexico City, that's a new one. Bombay, that's new. A lot of these are new. Sao Paulo, Brazil, New York is up there. Uh, again, uh, Lagos, Nigeria, LA. Calcutta, Shanghai, Buenos Aires. Check out the numbers. They're, of course, bigger. Maybe we can get some more in-depth analysis. Maybe we'll notice some pattern about the regions these places are in. So start thinking about that as the regions that these countries are in seem to change. Where were a lot of the cities, not countries rather, where were a lot of the cities in 1950 in terms of world regions that were the largest cities? What about 2000? So let's check out 2015. Tokyo still at the top, Bombay, Lagos, Dhaka, Sao Paulo, Karachi, Mexico City, New York, Jakarta, and Calcutta. Numbers are of course bigger, this shouldn't be a surprise, don't notice something that uh, simple. Of course cities get bigger, but again the region might be something more interesting. So let's see if you figured it out. What is this change that the largest cities in the world seem to have experienced? In short, it used to be a few decades ago that the largest cities in the world were in the developed world. Almost all of those cities, and number one, I'd say were in the developed world in 1950, except for number 10 and number eight, Buenos Aires and Calcutta. I suppose you'd say five and six would be on the border a little bit, but uh, certainly six would not have been at the time. Nowadays then, what's happened? Well, now a lot of the major cities in the world, most of them, top 10 at least, are in the developing world. We've talked a bit about why. A lot of countries that are in the developing world are simply not that urban yet. So if you think, well, the United States is um, very urban already, our cities can't really grow much more because the United States, most people by far already live in cities. And we know we're also not having that many kids. Uh, at least at this point in our history, we're not huge fans of immigration either. So if most people in the U.S. have already moved to cities, well, our cities are probably not going to get much bigger. In the developing world, lots of people still live in rural areas. So there's still tons and tons of people that are interested in moving to cities and improving their life. And of course, they're still having lots and lots of kids, uh, at least more than in the developed world. So this trend will probably continue where most of the largest cities in the world are going to be in the developing world. 
This means that in all these places, finding affordable living space that's also safe can be a huge challenge. I'll try to remember to post the link there to that video. Uh, the link is a short video. It's pretty amusing. It's just a two-minute news story of a guy in Japan. Japan's incredibly expensive. Maybe it will get cheaper as their population starts to dwindle, but still very expensive. And uh, this is a video about a guy who managed to build a house on a parking space he bought. Still very expensive. So you'll get to see what it's like to live in a house the size of a parking space. Another major type of city to know about is what's called a world city or a global city. More often I hear it referred to as a world city. This is a city that is like top of the heap in terms of how it drives globalization. How impressive is this city when it comes to its economic power, its power in shaping pop culture, in creating innovative new ideas, drawing in tourists from around the world. The lists always seem to change a tiny bit, uh, but generally the same cities tend to be in this list. So I contradicted myself there, so I'll, I'll explain. But like Paris is a well-known tourist city. It's not always at the exact top in terms of top tourist city in the world, but generally I'll correct myself and say that the list is usually pretty much the same in terms of what cities are, are considered world cities. So here's your quick list. Uh, New York, London, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Paris. There are gradations of world cities as well, like Chicago on some levels is considered a world city. I've told you before that we basically are home to the world's food prices. That's pretty darn important. We attract tens of millions of tourists every year, mostly from the USA, but a couple million come from uh, other countries. So what do some of these other cities do? Well, uh, I can't go into great detail, but New York is home to uh, the United Nations. Uh, New York is home to some of the great fashion shows every year. Uh, it's a huge tourist city, of course. London is one of the oldest cities in the world. has an amazing amount of history, tourism. I would say a lot of pop culture comes out of there, music especially. TV shows that you watch, like American Idol was originally a uh, pop idol, a British show. And their economic power is unquestioned. A lot of the mortgage rates in the world are originated in London. Tokyo, I couldn't tell you a whole lot about it, except uh, it's certainly a huge city. We just saw that. So it uh, attracts a lot of attention in terms of its tourism. Its pop culture is pretty unique as well. Some cool shows that you watch also come from Japan, not necessarily Tokyo specifically, but Tokyo is the, the primate city in Japan. So a lot of the pop culture originates from somewhere near there. And uh, a lot of great technology comes out of there. So they're certainly innovative. Uh, Hong Kong, Paris, a lot of the same things I've just said. You probably know Paris is a major fashion city. So uh, all sorts of things about these cities that make them unique uh, and powerful and influential around the world. That makes them a world city. The last type of city we'll talk about then is really just a bunch of cities all together. This is what's called a megalopolis. It's an area of cities that's grown together to form one continuous urban area. So as a simple example, just imagine if Chicago kept sprawling farther and farther out and our northern neighbor, Milwaukee, also kept sprawling farther and farther out. Eventually, if you were driving from Chicago to Milwaukee or vice versa, you just wouldn't see an end to all the urban structures in the built environment. You just see more and more buildings from one city to the next. So a megalopolis is something that you see when you have lots of large cities that continue growing near each other. Here's maybe the best known example in the United States. This is a picture of these cities at nighttime. So the white spots are the bright lights of these cities. And you can see they almost blend together into one big city. They're labeled there. This is what's called the Boz Wash Corridor because it goes all the way from Boston on the northern side to Washington, D.C. on the bottom. In between, you've got New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore. And while they don't quite connect, there are smaller urban areas that uh, would make it seem like if you were driving from Boston to Washington, D.C., you're really not leaving the city. I highly doubt you'd be passing any farms around here. Probably just have more peaceful suburbs between some of these darker places or in some of those darker places. So that's a megalopolis for you. Mega, of course, means big. 
Opolis is a Greek word for city, so it's like a mega city. No, oh, that's confusing, isn't it? One of our first terms we just learned is mega city. Oh boy. Well, don't think about that. It's a megalopolis. Oh, I just made it worse. Last thing then we'll get through today are these urban models. There's four of them. You can see three of them here. We'll get to one last one. These are pretty straightforward. A lot of them have the same patterns. So I ask you on the bottom of this slide, see if you can find some generalizations about these three models. We'll get to the fourth one, but is there anything you could find that's generally true about all three of these? So take a minute, stare at them. You don't have to pause the video, but I'll sort of stare at them with you here. You might notice that looking at the center of all three, the same thing is in the center. That's our central business district. Makes sense called the Central Business District. It's in the center. So let's check out some of the other stuff. Well, what's on the outside? Well, in this concentric zone model, we've got high class residential. So where's the high class residential here? Well, I guess a lot of it's towards the outside, but it also goes towards the inside. So I guess we couldn't say that the high class residential is only on the outside, although it is true here, far from the downtown area. What about like uh, the industries, so the factories, we've got number two represents factories. And in some of these models, we also see a number six that represents factories. So where do we see number two? Okay, so number two is next to downtown. Number two is sort of next to downtown, but also far away And here. Two is next to downtown. What about the medium class and low class residential? We've talked about the high class residential. Well, what about the medium and low class? Well, the low class in number three seems to be near the middle but also spreading out and by the factories here we've got low class residential near the center nearer than the other two types of housing and right next to the factories and here we've got low class housing near to downtown sort of but also near the factories so maybe we can say that low class residential tends to be around factories that makes sense if you're rich or medium income you probably would choose to move away from a factory. So then uh, maybe the last thing to point out then is that the middle income people are understandably in the middle. Often they're between the low and high class residents here. Not so much in this one, but we found a couple simple generalizations. Central business district tends to be in the center. That's easy. Low class housing tends to be by factories. Upper class housing tends to be far away from lower class housing and the factories. Okay, so that makes these models seem a little bit easier to digest. All we've got here then are different shapes or a different amount of logic or different, different logic for how they ended up getting these shapes. Let's check it out. So here's your generalizations we just talked about. All include a central business district and it's pretty much near the middle. They have multiple levels of housing quality. The lower quality ones are near the industries and the higher quality ones are far away from the industries. Easy enough. If you need me to go back, you can pause it and listen to that stuff or hold it there and get those notes down. So we're going to walk through those three models and uh, one last one. First, I'll compare the concentric zone model and Hoyt's sector model. I suppose I could go back real quick and point out the, the concentric zone models, this round one. The sector model is this one that looks kind of like pizza slices, or pie slices. So here's your concentric zone model. Sometimes it's easy to understand unfamiliar concepts by breaking down the words. You may not know what concentric means. Concentric basically means one shape within another. So you can see that we've got circles within circles within circles within circles. So this is a concentric model. Makes it easier to remember, hopefully. The concentric zone model we saw has a central business district in the middle, factories, low class housing, middle class housing, upper class housing. Great. You might remember our bid rent curve. More expensive land is used for more profitable activities. Less expensive land is used for less profitable activities. So if I've got super expensive land downtown, I'm going to build some tall buildings to make sure that I can get my money back when I pay for that expensive piece of land. I can now rent out many floors and make lots of money 
because I've built a tall building instead of a flat one. Companies tend to make more money than houses. They're perpetually making money. So industries tend to require cheaper land that is larger so you can build a huge factory. So they occupy some of that expensive land just outside the center, center of the city. Some of this stuff isn't true anymore. We don't have factories in Chicago really anymore. But you still find generally that they locate in areas where, uh, at least in the developing world, they're close to major transportation, close to downtown areas. That'll change eventually. And then we've got the most expensive housing towards the outside. This is the least efficient use of the land. It's a huge amount of land for huge houses. So you can just uh, buy a huge amount of land pretty cheaply, build a great house. And while the house is expensive on a per square foot basis, it's way cheaper than buying the same amount of land and filling it with small houses. <clears throat> so the bid rent curve, if you're trying to digest it, is based on sort of two things. What's the cost of the land and how much money are you going to get back for it? That influences what you do with the land. And that sets up um, what we'll get to later called a population density gradient. Where's the population going to be densest here? Well, generally, the density will be higher towards the outside of the, or I should say just outside the middle of the concentric zone model. So if you imagine a X and Y axis here where you've got population density and distance from the market, population density will be very high closer to the middle where you've got these lower class houses. And then as you get farther and farther out, population density decreases. Think of the suburbs. We have very few homes out here compared to the density of apartments and condominiums in downtown Chicago. That may be more information than you'll remember. Hoyt's sector model then just takes the idea of the concentric zone model and instead portrays it as pizza slices. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. They both tend to exist in a lot of cities. In fact, uh, both of these models were based on Chicago, which I'll put up here in a second. So uh, here is Hoyt's sector model. It's more based on getting access to the central business district. It does so or portrays that by showing you that here in number two, we've got uh, a highway area. So the industries also include highways. So this makes it easier to get to and from downtown, of course, if you've built uh, those transportation systems. And every part of the model has access to downtown. Um, while it looks like four doesn't, of course, they've got access to highways to get themselves there. So every one of these zones can get downtown fairly easily. That makes sense. So both models seem to make sense. And as I said, these are both based on Chicago, which is kind of cool. This is a super blurry picture, but you can see that both models that we just talked about apply to Chicago. This is a map of Chicago. Here's our Lake Michigan, so we can't have a full-blown circle because, of course, half of our city is uh, land and the other half east of us is a lake. But you've got our central business district called the Loop. You can see some pie slices here coming out from the middle. Like These are high-earning, high-income houses. This is the North Shore where Loyola Academy is. And then you've got your lower-class houses far away from the upper-class houses. This is also where a lot of our factories are. It doesn't say that down here, but this is where a lot of our factories could be. Uh, lower class housing also is uh, around the west side of the city. So you got this is sort of like your middle class housing. It's interesting that they call it low social status and then the lowest social status. It would be nice if they did high, middle, and low. But we've also got people out in the suburbs here. So this is kind of like the concentric zone model where it looks like they're just out here because they're far away. So these are some of the rich suburban people that are in other parts of the city, not necessarily the nicest parts by the lake, but still pretty nice to have a big house and a big lawn, all that stuff. So you can see both models apply. The second to last of these models is the harris ullman Multiple Nuclei Model. Ooh, doesn't that sound fun? This is just based on the idea that uh, not everything's isotropic. Some of these other models that we just saw, like the sector model, like pie slices or the concentric zone model, assume that everything's sort of the same everywhere, and that's not realistic. So the harris ullman model bases their logic or their model more on the fact that some places are better for things than others. So the patterns that we saw before about the central business district being in the middle, factories tending to be near lower class housing, 
and higher class housing being farther from downtown and farther from factories all apply here. So you can see we've got our central business district, upper class housing is far away from there. Our factories are somewhat near downtown, but could also be far from downtown. Depends on what the manufacturing is like. You've got lower class housing next to those sort of undesirable areas, middle class housing in between. So this would just spread out in this fashion just because something about areas two and six were good for the industries. Perhaps there was a source of natural resources there or access to good infrastructure like railroads, airports, who knows what. And uh, maybe the area out here is just more open, cheap land. Finally, we'll check out the Galactic City model. This one is a little bit more current. This is like an updated version of some of the models we saw before reflects a little bit more of reality today, at least as far as my opinion goes. This is also sometimes called the peripheral model. We've still got the central city here, but this model focuses on the idea of suburbs. What we saw before was just cities. Didn't really talk about suburbs. Well, now, of course, we know since the 50s and 60s, we've had suburbs grow. A lot of those previous models were developed uh, before suburbs really were a major part of urban areas. So the Galactic City model shows us these suburbs and uh, portrays them as these little uh, blobs kind of around the outside. Um, so number two you can see is our suburban residential area and some of these places have their own special attractions. Um, so number three and number three is a mall. So think of Woodfield Mall in Schaumburg. That attracts a lot of people. That's a very unique aspect to one of our suburbs. Uh, we've also got some industrial areas like number four here. Um, you probably don't know of too many industrial areas around here, but I showed you Elk Grove, about a half hour away from here, has um, a fair amount of manufacturing. We've got some office parks. I showed you one of those in Schaumburg. There's way more than that. There's some service centers that could be like infrastructure, potentially. Uh, airports. And then a whole bunch of stuff that's combined employment and shopping centers. So just think you've got the central city and then a whole bunch of suburbs, some of which are very unique uh, in the surrounding areas. Good example of an edge city, one of these surrounding suburbs that's very unique is Rosemont. Uh, Rosemont attracts a lot of people from even the inner city, uh, like downtown Chicago. People might go out to Rosemont because it has a casino or because it's got shops. If you drive uh, down Highway 90 into Chicago, you might notice there's a indoor skydiving facility that has a big sign off the highway so people want to go there and experience that. They have some big German restaurants. Uh, they have a huge theater that attracts uh, big name acts. Um, the Allstate Arena used to be called the Rosemont Horizon. Uh, Allstate Arena is in Rosemont and um, attracts huge shows. Uh, there's other theaters there. There's a Rosemont Theater which is like a common sit-down theater whereas an arena is like for sports and bands and stuff like that. Uh, and it really doesn't have many residences. So uh, Rosemont's kind of unique. It's almost just attractions and nothing else. So you can understand why it would attract a lot of people uh, from surrounding areas. Sort of orbits around the central city of Chicago. So that, that kind of gives some more meaning to the galactic city, city model. It's not just like you have one city. You also have these hovering, rotating, or... Um, attracted cities, attractive cities around there that have some pull. So that kind of demonstrates the gravity model a little bit. Last thing we'll do then is see if we can find some proof of some of these models in Atlanta. You've got four choices. You've got your multiple nuclei model, the harris ullman model. You've got your sector pie slice model, your concentric zone model, and you've got your galactic city model. So we're going to check out Atlanta and uh, see if you can find, if I were in class, I'd say you should talk about this with people around you, but I'm not here. So stare at the map, see if you can figure it out on your own. And uh, try and decide um, what statistics you might want to look at to find out which of these models apply. You know that the models differ somehow where they put their people. So what kind of statistic might you look at to figure out where people are? most common. Maybe that influences your decision. Maybe since you know that some pieces of those pie slices or parts of the model uh, make more money than others, maybe you can use some data based on that. So I'll show you some pictures of Atlanta here. 
uh, models or maps of Atlanta, not pictures, and uh, see if you can figure it out. I may talk you through some of it here, but we've got some data. Uh, kind of answered your question already. This is population density. And uh, you can see that we've got a distinct pattern here. Densest generally down here. Less dense a little bit further out. The farther out you get from downtown Atlanta, the less dense it is. Nice choropleth map. So what model does that seem to be? If it seems like it's dense, less dense, and even less dense. And uh, maybe you can also find the central business district. These red lines, by the way, are highways. That might clue you in somewhere. I tell you, it's just one blob. Each blob here is a zip code. So maybe you can spot it. Interesting to note that in the center of all this dense population, there seems to be some blob that is not quite as dense. We may talk more about that another day when we talk about that residential density gradient, but it's not always the densest. You won't always find the densest population in the most expensive part of the city. Why would that be? What's the best use of your money? If you had a billion dollars, would you be better off building a tall, apartment or condominium building in downtown Chicago in the center of downtown or would you be better off building an office building? Which one would make you the most money? Hopefully uh, you can guess that it would be a business building, an office building. Offices or I should say businesses have way more money than people do so they've got more money to spend. You'd make more money if you built an office building. That explains why central business districts often don't have a whole lot of people and even the name tells you it's a central business district. So you may have a lot of people living down here, but that's your blob. That's where the central business district of Atlanta is. Still is fairly dense, but notice that the surrounding areas are just a little bit cheaper. Businesses certainly still locate there, but there's way more housing here because a lot of people want to live close to downtown and the land's just cheap enough that you're better off living just a bit farther outside in huge buildings. So this shows us our sector, pardon me, concentric zone model. Is there anything about this that's sector? I don't know. Let's check out one more map here. This one shows us a different type of data. This shows us median household income. It's not average. It's basically the middle, not the average, but the middle amount of income. So it shows us that the north side of Atlanta seems to be way more wealthy than the south side west side and east side seem to be middle income. That seems to follow the sector model. We said wealthy housing or wealthy people tend to live farther from the poor populations. Middle income people tend to be somewhere in between. So see if you can spot anything else on this model that uh, shows you that it might be concentric zone or sector model. Maybe there's some other data you can find uh, that will show you whether we have uh, other models present in Atlanta. We haven't looked at the uh, multiple nuclei model. We haven't looked at the galactic city model. If I were in class, I would uh, have you do something that will get you to see whether some of these other models apply. With this data, it's a bit hard to see. So simply take the time to do the rest of the things on the uh, assignment center that I list there for you and uh, we'll do an activity next class just to see if we can find some of these other models uh, in Atlanta. Hope this was helpful and easy to understand. Uh, have a great day.